Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Charlemagne the God. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, indeed. Jamil Hill. Welcome back. Hey, you know I always love to sit with y'all. Enjoy the, the conversations. That's right. And the paperback is out right now. It is. Congratulations. Yeah. My, my my baby is grown up a little bit. It's mm -hmm. now a, a toddler, I guess. So a year ago, the, the hardcover of uh, my memoir Uphill came out, and now the paperback. How was the the response to putting out a memoir? Because you know, in memoirs, you put out. So much information, you mm -hmm. reveal things you probably never told anybody. What yeah. was the response? Not just from the general public, but from like your family and stuff. Um, the response was generally good. It was mm -hmm. mostly positive. There mm -hmm. was somebody in my family who took issue with it. And um, that created some tension. Mm. And the tension is still there, unfortunately. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm still processing that part. <laughs> Did then, you not have a conversation before? I, I, no, I mean, it was, I was, I didn't think, uh, we did have a conversation before, but I just didn't think, I didn't think how they reacted to it would be the way they reacted, and they took it to Facebook as opposed to taking it to me. <laughs> That's and usually that, how it happens and nowadays. Yeah, and then they aired out stuff that was not even in the book, and it was like, why you, why? And you, probably stuff that wasn't true. Um, yeah, uh, some of it was was definitely I looked at very skeptically, um, and it wasn't about me. It was it was about my mom to be candid, and so I was not I was not happy that 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 was the course of action that they chose, and so it it caused a fracture. In our relationship. Oh, I know the feeling. Mm -hmm. After so. I put on my first book, it was the same thing. And family members, oh, I can't write a book, but I can go to Facebook. Right. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, and especially it's not like this person couldn't have called me. Like they could have, yeah. and we could have had a conversation about it. And I guess the surprising part, they didn't take issue with what was written as in terms of like it not being true. The issue was when we finally did have that discussion was that they weren't in it enough. Oh. Mm. So that really... So they wanted their side out there. Or, yeah, or they, oh, and they just felt be. like they should have been, you know, um, that their role in my life should have been more highlighted or more. And I thought I did a pretty good job of it as it was, but apparently it was not on par with this person. And so, it, yeah. Was their role in your life as big as they actually thought it was? Well, I mean, I guess if you want me to say what it is, because <laughs> I, I see you, you're getting to, but it was my father who had an issue with oh, it. Oh, Yeah, so gotcha, it was gotcha, my father gotcha. had an issue with some of the things that were in the book, not necessarily because they were untrue, but he felt like he should have been more prominently featured in the book. That True. was what I got from it. And so I, I didn't, you know, that didn't, it wasn't a, it was a very difficult conversation to have. Um, and so those conversations have been, Somewhat on, ongoing, and I told him I needed to kind of press pause because mm -hmm. I need to process what you said to me because I didn't, I, I took a lot of issue with it. So no rewrites for the paperback? No rewrites for the paperback. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so no, I was like, I, I took issue with it, but it's 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 all good because everybody's not going to love, you know, what you write. Like, and it is funny we're having this conversation because obviously in the news is, is, is Jada Pinkett Smith. Her, oh my God. Her memoir is coming out. Yeah, and right. Jada and I, when I did, I did Red Table Talk this time last year, and I was telling her and sharing my experience. She was writing it then. And mm. I was like, you know, um, I, I don't know what the reaction is going to be. It just kind of is what it is. And so to see a year later how people are responding to some of the things that she has decided to share, it's like, she's, you know, this is her story. She's allowed to tell what that is. I agree with that. But, and I was saying this this morning on the radio, what is the point of constantly sharing this with us? Because it always looks like, you're beating up on Will. Why, do, why it, does it seems everybody very one sided? Why does everybody think Will is the victim? That's what I want to know. Because Will isn't saying anything. Well, just because he's saying it, like I think because it was funny reading the reaction because I I don't know what's happening inside their marriage, right? Yeah, Let exactly. me That's none, said, of yeah, do, none of us right? do, none right? None of us know. Okay, but at least from because um, when I did Red Table Talk last year, Will pop he popped up and talked to him. He was great, like, and it, it's clear that they still have. Just because they're separated doesn't mean there's not affection there. That doesn't mean that there's not respect there's there. There's not love there. There's not love there. Like, right. I think that was kind of obvious in the, the interview clips that I've seen so far is that this is the path that they have chosen. But I, I think it's a path they mutually chose. And so I guess the narrative that I reject, even though, again, I don't know the inside of their marriage, is this idea that Will is a hostage in this. And I'm like, I don't think he's a hostage. I think he's OK with where they are. Well, you right, know. and maybe, maybe to your point, Char is like maybe we shouldn't know this we all know it, yeah. publicly. I agree. But if he's, but think about the reason we do know it publicly. It's like the whole entangle, entanglement thing happened because somebody else 
was talking. Oh, that's August true. told, okay? Right. Am I, am, do that's I have true. this yeah, chronology true. right? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. They responded to something else that was told. So it's not like she came out of nowhere and was like, hey, by the way, guys, there was something that happened between me and August Alcina. That man said what it was. I love August. Salute to August. Yeah, but the like I don't have is, a. August, what August did with Angela Yee was nowhere near as big as. The red table talk. No, it's not. But she but, was responding. But she was responding. But, but, but this, but this is the thing too. Like and this, is what we said yesterday. You know, sometimes we look at celebrities' relationships, and everybody thinks everybody's relationship is perfect, right? So I think it's great sometimes when you say, "Hey, my relationship ain't perfect." Right. Like just because you see this doesn't mean we don't have the same problems that you do, the same disagreements, the same arguments. So when you see a little bit of that, I'm sure there's somebody in a life just like them that be like, "Damn, me and my husband is separated, or me and my wife's been separated for this amount of time, and we're dealing with it." And we thought it was odd. We never wanted to share. We never wanted to tell somebody. But if it looks quote unquote normal, whatever normal is, mm -hmm. it gives me the ability to talk. Because right, you and your wife have been very candid about some of the ups and downs you faced in your relationship. Absolutely. Because people. You know, people need to know sometimes that like what you see on Instagram is not what this mm -hmm. what this is. And so I don't think it was at a point um, where maybe this is some information she didn't feel like should right. stay buried. Because, look, she's part of her brand now is that is divulging these uncomfortable truths and mm -hmm. talking about them. It is her story. She has the right to say it. So I just I, I, I guess I'm just really surprised that people sort of characterize this, that, that Will is somehow in this marriage against his will and Jade is the villain and she's the one that is making him do all this stuff. And I was like, that man is grown, okay? Yeah, I don't disagree with that. It's just that when you hear, like, I never wanted to marry Will. I cried at the wedding. <laughs> now it's, we've been separated for seven years. That does sound crazy. It's that like, does. Jada, why are you that, doing that? that why you, you got the man sitting there at the red table talking talking about the entanglement? You could clear he don't want to be like. Why is this that, happening? That sounds like that's, 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 that's all. Because I love both yeah, of them. I call right. myself a Pink and Smith Winfrey Nose Carter. So I'm just sitting back like, <laughs> why is this happening? Like that's all I be wanting to know. Why? Well, you know, I, I will say that sounds a little crazy. With with every, I know that people look at it as like her honesty is is maybe hurting him and making this worse than it is. It's like okay, she's being so honest to the point where you wonder like, all right, did you have to pour it? on that thing but I think it, it just feels like um, that this is sort of the ebb and flow of their relationship and we're kind of witnessing it yeah. and maybe it's not what we picture because they have been held in such high esteem they have been relationship goals mm -hmm. for so many people for so long but I'm like y'all don't know what's happening behind That's closed real. doors y'all do not know these mm -hmm. people alright and I just I don't think Will is being victimized and I understand why some people take issue with her level of honesty Saying like, does all this need to be said? But I, I, I don't think Will is like some kind of victim. And I'm sure Will held against it. Will. I'm sure Will knew it was coming out before. It was coming. Of course I'm sure they had is. to have a conversation. I'm yeah. sure he didn't, the first day he seen it was on Red, Red Table Talk, and she was like, "I cried before I married." I'm sure they had these conversations because they had to work on their relationship, right? I don't know, man. I mean, I, I don't know. That's my point. I don't know. I can't what even you speculate. Say, you say, "Well, blink if you need to come out." Like, that's how you treat him. It's like, yeah, like that blink man and, is okay. Yeah, okay. He's fine. I don't think it's that. I just, like I said, I, I just don't think the general public needs to know everything. Right. I think that's what I do miss about celebrity. I want people to be go back to being mysterious. mysterious. Yes, yeah, man. I know. That's why I love Sade. Like oh. she, we don't know if this woman is real or not. <laughs> she could be a hologram. Right. I, I have no idea. That's right. But she just pop up every about fifteen years. Might have an album, might not. That's right. She do the same two and steps. It keeps it moving. And I love this woman. That's yeah. Right. Like I don't even know what she sounds like anymore. And by the way, we don't even care. No. She never gave us nothing, so nobody no. in her business. None at at, at all. That's she right. living her best life somewhere. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Sade. Now, what do you think? <laughs> what do you think a second Jamel Hill book would be about? Well, there will be another Jamel okay. Hill book, and um, it is much like this memoir of something I didn't expect to write, but the second book will be a children's book. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. so I'm writing a children's book, um, and it will cover some parts of Uphill, like just kind of, you know, um, how I was able to overcome some adversity and, you know, some of the, the, the more positive career stuff. Like, some of that will be part of it, but generally speaking, it will be... Um, sort of like my love letter to a lot of the women whose stories haven't been told, a lot of the women who I've admired. And so it'll, um, I'm really looking forward to it. I've never <laughs> written for a children's audience before. So this will be quite a, a challenge. It'll be the opposite almost from um, a memoir because you're pouring everything into this book. And, you know, it's like 250, 300 pages in a children's book. You have to be quite concise and you have to make sure that they understand the general themes that you're trying to. What is it going to be about? Do you know yet? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it'll be a combination of my story and the stories of, of women who um, whose stories need to be told and, you know, women I've admired.
So yeah, some of them famous, some of them not as famous as others. I mean, I'm trying to like really unearth and tell the stories of some women who who probably didn't get the flowers that they deserved. Got gotcha. you. Yeah. Now we just had a offset up here, mm -hmm. and you, you had some uh, words about his interview with how you pronounce his name, Bobby, Bobby Alfalf. 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 Yeah. Alfalf. Yeah. The podcaster. And you said uh, you, you feel like this is erasing real hip hop journalism. Yeah, I do. I mean. Listen, I, I admit I'm spoiled. It's like when uh, when hip hop was really coming into its own and growing. You know, that's when you had Vibe, you had Kevin Powell and Dream Hampton and Danielle Smith, and there was like a real hip hop journalism sort of movement there that covered the culture, that covered these artists, tried to tell the full 360 dimensions of their stories. And as you know, you know, mainstream media wasn't messing with hip hop like that. They weren't telling these stories, and so now it's just interesting to me the platforms they wind up on like look at sexy red like why was she on that podcast for what you know with Theo with Theo Vaughn. like that <laughs> does that seem like the type of podcast that you would expect sexy red to be right. on probably not mm -hmm. i don't know because Theo Vaughn's interesting yeah he is he i had mean funny he marco on there one day one time he and he was talking <laughs> He was talking about how sexy I was. That's all Charlamagne cares about. <laughs> the fact that that <laughs> man called him that's sexy. We, that's, that's all wait, Charlamagne cares about. Theo Vaughn. Oh, really? Yeah, he okay. did. It was like a whole five minutes. He's minute been thing blushing he ever about how since. I am. Not blushing. Like, I think he wanted a beautiful him. man. He was like, I'm like, look at him. I'm he brushing now. Look at his face. Look at his face. A compliment is a compliment. I was flattered. I was like, wow. Not blushing, dog. He's so silly. Charlamagne, take him on a date. He said, I got lady features. I promise you, that's what he was saying. <laughs> Look, he remembers every last <laughs> detail. <laughs> it was, I do, I do. But that's, so I don't, I don't know what Theo's angle is. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, he he's had a, an eclectic group of guests. Mm -hmm. So I guess maybe from that standpoint, you could say that she fits. But it's just, um, I when I watch that interaction, and I get it. I know what it, her shtick is. A lot of it, uh, as many people say, like she clearly borrowed some of this from Funny Marco, who I actually think does it pretty well. He does. Yeah, like he 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 has. He's got a good thing going. Um, and her, I, I guess looking at her rise, it was kind of curious to me. Like her podcast has not been existence in existence that, for that long. I think mm -hmm. the way the story was told was like Drake saw her on, on, on TikTok, I think. Yeah, on TikTok. But she was mm -hmm. with Funny Marco. I think that's the interview that he saw. Mm -hmm. That's a, sure. At least that's sort of what's been reported and out there. And then he just up and decided, you know, hey, I'm going to just go on this random podcast, which he has every right to do. But when I look about who are the caretakers of hip hop, the caretakers of how this culture is covered, it, it, it's us, you know, mm -hmm. for the most part. Mm -hmm. and that's not to say that Offset can't do interviews with people outside the culture, but I notice how those interviews are received and for their, that matter, how they're treated on those interviews. And it makes me concerned overall. And yeah, you know, honestly, I know a lot, a ton of black journalists who could go, who could use that kind of boost. Mm -hmm. And to me, mm -hmm. especially given we see the danger of when our stories aren't told and they're trying to erase our stories in real time. It just, I would like to see artists like him, artists like Drake, other uh, black artists in general, be more intentional about the type of media that they try to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that's why breakfast club yeah. has the, the status and the stature that it does, because this is a place that has been established for the culture. And it would be nice if some of these artists understood that there's something larger at play than just going viral. No, I agree. I agree with you because I, I feel like you know, if you think about an artist like Drake or or if I was Drake, I would never come or, or Yachty or well, any of these. Yeah, <laughs> no. I mean, you know what I'm saying? You ain't been easy on my man. I mean, dealing with you, I mean, obviously, right? but, but like, I, you, you got that's a choice, right? Like, yeah. why would I go in here and deal with that on a random? But maybe not Wednesday? you. But I agree. But you give somebody an opportunity that is not from the culture that probably does not care about the culture, and Correct. there's a lot of black journalists that are coming from all these different spaces that would die for an interview like that. That you could really make their career. Yeah, you know what I mean. So, so you rather see Drake with Funny Marco? If he was going to do an interview like that, you'd rather see him do it with Funny Well, Marco. and especially because it was kind of Funny Marco's thing, Absolutely. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that would have made, you know, kind of more sense. And even if you look at, you know, I know he's a friend of the show, Roland Martin. Like, Roland Martin has one of the few black-owned media platforms right. there are. Like, they're, they're practically non-existent. So that, to me, should be a platform that black celebrities and entertainers and musicians intentionally try to go on understanding what the landscape looks like. I mean... Well, did they look at Roland in that way? Did they look at Roland as a person? Well, I, know Roland, I know Roland has had a lot of entertainers like on mm -hmm. his show before, and mm -hmm. I know I get it from a political ramp, just using him as an example, but like when you look at how um, black media voices, um, you know, the dearth of them that are out there, thankfully there's this, you know, you of course you have like, you know, other shows where... Angie hip, Martinez. Angie, mm -hmm. Angela Yee, like yep. there they're, they're are other platforms, mm -hmm. but... I feel like that they should be very intentional about the places that they go because what what happens is the situations that you you see with Sexy Red that's what happens.
This feels like brown sugar. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, it's like, we know, we know what hip hop is and what, what we want it to be. But when it gets so big, like we're gonna have to share our artists with other people. So yes, I think they can do both. Yeah, I, I think they can do both. I, I guess what sometimes what does bother me is that knowing some of the teams behind some of them, and like you said, like if you're Drake, why would you come on Breakfast Club? Because mm -hmm. you know he knows that you've had critical questions that you've asked about mm -hmm. him and and critical conversations. And their team, they don't they don't ever want them to face any challenges in terms of interviewing. And I think that is why a lot of celebrities now think their interviews should be softball interviews and they think that the people that are sitting across from them should try to promote them or be part of their their brand you know like Deion Sanders after he won that the, the first game and he was like do you buy in well it's not the media's job to buy in it's the job to cover what we see mm -hmm. and to like ask critical questions of like what's happening here and a lot of publicity teams they do not want their artists in the possible position to where they have to actually answer a real question right. it doesn't have to be combative but there there are things that they should be made to, to answer. Absolutely. As now, part of their responsibility to the culture. Now, recently, Colin Kaepernick wrote a letter to the Jets. Mm -hmm. uh, you were in support of that. Mm -hmm. Talk about it. Yep. Um, so, as you guys know, there's a, like a, so many false narratives out there about him. One, you know, people, whenever his name comes up, they start running away with these things that they've supposedly heard or supposedly have been reported that haven't been. Mm -hmm. He's never been offered any money. By any, there, he's never been offered a contract by a, another team since he left the 49ers. So this idea that Collinwood is asking for all kinds of money or that he said he only wants to be a starter, that he never wants to be a backup, like none of that was ever true. Mm -hmm. And I think the one benefit to people seeing that letter is knowing how earnest and committed that he is. He just asked to run the practice squad. He said in the letter, we know you, I know you're trying to prepare Zach Wilson to be the starter this season. I'm fine with that. I'm here to support that. I'll just run a practice squad. And anybody and for those of you who don't know about the practice squad, every NFL team has one. And these are fringe NFL players. Like, he could run a practice squad and admit it. I mean, it's, it's frankly, given his skill level and where he was in the game, it's something that would probably be beneath him in terms of skill set. But he is willing to do that just to show how much he wants to still um, keep his NFL dream alive. So I, I, I was glad that the letter came out so people could see what his true intentions are and, frankly, always have been. I didn't like it for exactly what you just said. Why is that? It's beneath him. Like, he's Colin Kaepernick. Like, you have grown to be this this figure that mm -hmm. people look to with, with, with reverence. You know, we love what you stood for or kneeled for, you know, and it's just like, I don't want to see you writing a letter begging these people for a job on the practice But part. here's the thing, though, as Charlemagne, is that what he doesn't want to do is leave them with an excuse. Like, they can't say, oh, he was unwilling to be on a practice squad and he was unwilling to do you know, something that would be considered like very entry level work. They can't say that because that those are narratives that the NFL has, you know, secretly tried to float out there to try to undermine his credibility. It's like, oh, well, if he really loved um, playing professional football, then he would lower himself and, and take this entry level job. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I would. So now what's your excuse? All right. You said I couldn't throw. You said I was washed up. OK, the Raiders said I had a great workout. What's your excuse? So this shifts it back to them. So what is your excuse? I don't think anybody believes that, though. I think we know why Colin Kaepernick is not in the NFL. I think they're, well, I'll <laughs> like say this. We know. He, took, he kneeled for police brutality, I mean, against police brutality. Right. And he got blackballed. Yeah. Like, nobody ever thought that, oh, it's because teams didn't want to but sign But you'd be surprised like there's still a lot of people. And, and granted, I'll admit, these are probably people who were never down with his protest to begin with, mm -hmm. who really want to believe that the only reason he's not in the league is just simply because he's not good enough. Even though we've seen these backups, right? Nathan, Pe Nathan Peterman still got a job, right? Mm -hmm. we, we see what's happening, right? And they still are clinging to this idea that sports is a meritocracy, and if he were really that good, then he would be out there. But they, change, they always change the argument sort of mid-conversation. It goes from, yes, it's a football decision. Well, no team wants to deal with that. Well, either it's a football decision or it's not. Right. Is he going to make your team better or not? That's really all it boils down to. So I was happy he wrote the letter so people could really see, um, you know, kind of where his true intentions are. I feel like you you it, you never really said anything disparaging about ESPN. Really? Not. I mean, not really. Now, you I mean, I'm not saying I want to. Really. Yeah, you, you've never, you've never like, called oh. them a plantation. No. You've never accused anybody over there of being racist. 
A little bit. Well, a little I kind of did. did. Kinda I, I, I kind of did. did. Okay, well, <laughs> kind of did. Okay. did. But, I, I, but I know what you're saying. But with that said, you, I know Jamel Hill ain't going back to ESPN. But the thing is, there's other places I could go. But you wouldn't go back to ESPN. Well, well I wouldn't I say would, that. I mean, you never if know. If management though. changes, if ownership changes, and then you have a she might go and back. And you know how things change in TV all the time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, technically, I mean, ESPN is paying me right now because I'm executive producing Colin Kaepernick's documentary, which is airing on ESPN and directed by Spike Lee. So... Technically, yeah. I mean, I, I, there's a, you know, there's a check that comes by, via them, so gotcha, to speak. Gotcha, you gotcha. know, so, mm -hmm. um, but I, I know what you're saying. The thing is, the NFL is one on one, right? It's like if if things didn't work out at ESPN, I can go to FS1 or I can go to CNN or other places. Like if it doesn't work out in the NFL and that's the highest professional level, that's it. So, and that's what he, that's where he already was. It's not like he was aspiring and hadn't made it. No, he went to a Super Bowl. So he's already been to that pinnacle. So in, in that regard, because I know people are like, why would he still try to be a part of the same league that he sued? And called racist. And, and called, called yeah, and called racist. And, and, and we know how the, the NFL works. But a lot of us, especially when we choose to pursue a passion that we love, are in situations and working for corporations that make questionable decisions and questionable hires. We all are caught up in this game. I mean, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but he feels like, and I understand this wholeheartedly, he's owed this. He worked for this. This is not something they gave him. And that is why he is insistent, like, oh, no, y'all going to give me the opportunity that I fully earned. And we've seen other black athletes do it before. Like, uh, the black athletes that have been ostracized, you know, even when Mahmoud Abdul-Raouf was ostracized, he wanted to be part of the NBA, right? And so mm -hmm. because they feel like I did all this blood and sweat to get here. You think I'm not going to take this opportunity? I earned this. My blood is on this. Don't you think sometimes when God puts you in a different position, like when God exalts you in mm -hmm. a different position, because that's what I feel like happened with Cap. Don't you feel like sometimes you have to let go of things to really embrace the blessing of what is? I think he's been able to do both. He'll never let it go. Uh, somebody asked Jesus me recently. Jesus Christ. He'll never let it go. I, I don't blame him. I, like, I don't. Like, I, I would probably be on that, too. Yeah. I don't know if I would be able to stand as strong as he has stood with it, but, like, I would be on that, too. Like, oh, no, you—, you just just on some pride and petty, I would never file my retirement papers if I were him. But I do understand because, like I tell Charlamagne, you know, a kid that plays football, I got two boys that play football, like they did it since age four or five. Mm -hmm. Five days a week, in the rain, sleet, snow, four hours a day, then a game on Sunday. You give so much of your life. You miss half your summer with it, so that's all you know. Right. So I, 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 I do back. understand. I can never get that feeling because it was like it's kind of like radio or, or me talking like – it's something that I would want to do all the time. And like you said, that's the only place to do it. Like, just, you can't do XFL, his... you can't do practice team, but I also feel like... You can't do like, all of that, though. Why can't yeah, you Because it's not XFL. the same. It's not the same level of competition. Why can't you do Canada? If you, it's Canadian not the same level league. of competition. But I, but my question is, if you knew that's what you wanted, right? And you knew that when you stood stood up for uh, against uh, violence against, against us, right? At that point, when you were about to lose it, why didn't you say, you know what? The game is more important than this. Oh, but then because he could have, because he could, he, he, he could have, and he didn't. He because did. but then you can't be mad at everybody's. Well, no, well, no, you can though, because is that really what should cost you your job in this? It shouldn't, it right? Should not. Because Absolutely, on like the not. NFL is wrong, all it right? Is. It's like standing up for what is a humanitarian issue, correct? Right? Yep. Should not be the thing that costs you your entire career, right? So it is about principle, but if and it like does, had he, but had he chosen the game. I don't know. I don't think he would could live with himself. I, like, I get for it. doing that to say like, oh, I stopped kneeling because the NFL told me they didn't like it. You can't really live with that. I mean, right. I know there's been professional stands that you both have probably taken, mm -hmm. many of which we don't even know about, right? Correct. And when you take these stands, you decide right then, like, hey, if this goes in a in a in a negative direction, I'm okay with it. I but felt I that I knew there was no going back, and I yeah. me knew there was no going back. No, there were there. But he wants to go back. But he wants to go back because he's owed that. Because as you said, like you brought up your boys, he's done the same thing. Then to go through college, then to every step that he's been, he's never he's made he made he's made this point before. Every step that he's been, he's never been the number one guy. He's always had to fight to be the number one guy. Mm -hmm. So he's used to this fight. So no, he's like I, I worked hard to be here. I deserve this opportunity, and I'm not gonna let you. Um, I'm not gonna let you make it seem as if I'm the one that has created this and I'm not ready. And I think the NFL needs to be reminded um, that this is going to be a very black mark on their history. But we know that though. I, once again, I, we know that he got blackballed. 
And we understand the sacrifice that he made. That's why people hold him in the high regard. I just don't mm-hmm. want his setback to become his identity. No, I, I don't it think it's like, like that. I don't, I don't think it's like that. But I, I do think that he feels a responsibility. That's why he's in, you know, I, I've told people this before, you know, having been able to spend, um, you know, a lot of time with him is like physically he looks better than he did when he was last playing quarterback for the 49ers. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's been injury free, I assume pain free for years now. Hasn't taken any hits. Still is on a football schedule, you know, waking up. Uh, working out at 5 a.m. every day, still going through the same training regimen that he did when he was playing. Because, he, again, he doesn't want to give them the excuse. We all heard it as kids. You have to work twice as hard. And one of the things a lot of our parents drilled into us is that when the opportunity comes, it's our responsibility to be ready. And he feels like he would be doing a disservice to everything that he stood for if that call ever came. And he's like, oh, I'm out of shape. Uh, mm-hmm. I can't. Like, they're not going to catch him slipping. So that's why I don't ever expect this man to retire from right. the league. Yeah, it's not going to happen. No, nobody would have an issue if, if he didn't say they were racist, a plantation, and if people around him, because, you know, he doesn't speak for himself, no. but if people around him hadn't bashed other folks for wanting to be in business with the NFL. So, like, Rock Nation. Malcolm Jenkins. They call all of these people sellouts for wanting to do business with the same league that you're trying to get back into. Because I do think it it does matter your dynamic with the league. And I think his issue, and I I do, again, I I understand this, his issue was that we're much better and have more power standing in solidarity as opposed to, I mean, we already already know, like the the NFL Super Bowl uh, halftime show was on life support. Like nobody was messing with this at all. And we gave, and it, it goes beyond Colin. And we, you know, willingly gave them access to our culture and they definitely did not deserve it. Right. They don't. We know based off their history, the history of this country, they don't deserve a lot of things that black people do. We know this. (laughs) This is our existence. This is part of it is that that's part of the, the, the struggle and the tension point is that we're constantly fighting to be validated and in these systems that were never meant for us. That is the black existence in America mm-hmm. for the most part, right? And so I think this struggle is no different because it's more meaningful for him if he ever is able to get back on the field, what that will mean, meaning that like you can't kill somebody's career for this. Yes, you may not have liked the criticism toward this country. You may have not have liked the criticism toward this league. By the way, criticism, that's not wrong. Mm-hmm. I mean, the NFL was race norming up until a few years ago, okay, mm-hmm. where they actively had policy that stated that black brains and black bodies were not worth as much as white bodies. That was literally policy, mm-hmm. okay? So what he said about the league is true. What do you mean policy? Break that uh, so race norming, mm-hmm. um, this is one of the things that they used when it came to settling some of the head trauma lawsuits. They basically, what was part of this, um, what was part of the NFL practice is that they pretty much said that black players, and everybody can look it up, you can go to Google, just look up NFL and race norming, this is all there, it's one of the more undercover stories about them, that they pretty much said, they came up with a calculation where um, the head trauma that black uh, athletes suffered in the league, because they said there were certain cognitive abilities that were not there inherently race norming like race norming has been used in a lot of different medical fields frankly to justify Mm -hmm. um medical racism on us and the nfl was using the same practice so if y'all look it up you will see and they had they stopped doing it i believe in either 2015 or 2016 it's why um some of the black players didn't receive as much money from the concussion lawsuit as some of the white players did because they had race norming as part of the formula to figure out who deserved what that is the NFL. So, That's again, crazy. like I said, wow. he was telling the truth. And unfortunately, a lot of the systems that we are a part of have practiced in something, something yeah. distasteful, dishonorable, something that excluded us. And part of our fight is that because we built this country and because we're going to make America um, live up to that brochure they all told to us. great again. I was like, come no, on. No, oh God, no. You know I'm not going to say that. You know I'm not going to say that. <laughs> no, nah, but I mean, black people, frankly, I mean, this is something Nicole Hannah Jones has talked about a lot. It's like we are the ones holding this damn democracy together That's because right. we are believing in we the believe principle. Because yeah. we actually believe in it and we're going to make you do it. And so I think with Colin, it's a similar fight. Oh, no, no, you said this. I'm going to make you believe it. I'm going to make you actually do what you said you were going to do. I would, mm-hmm. I would love to see, and, and I understand Colin Kaepernick. I understand, like I said, I, I understand it's it's in his blood, right? That's what he knows. But I also would love to see him, when you talk about legacy, I would love to see him do something like go to an HBCU or be a coach. 
Because mm. the amount of now, attention that idea. he would bring there, the amount of, of kids that he can actually teach, I think it would be more impactful Way than more. if he made the league. Way if more. he made the league, yeah. okay, cool. But if he takes a school like a Howard, a Hampton, a Morgan State, a Alabama State A&M, All right. South, whatever, and he coached that and got them to that level, I think it would show everybody like a, that would be even a bigger F you. I okay. Agree. That's interesting. And next time I see him, I'll be like, hey, you ever thought about coaching? <laughs> Does he talk in his documentary? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, Charlie no. swears he don't talk. He, he don't really talk for himself ever. Yeah. And I don't like that either. Yeah, so I, I, see, I saw, I've already seen some of your comments in it. I, I've yeah. got, you know, I got the video back and everything. I have to give the notes. Um, no, I, I think what people will hear from him in this doc, I mean, he, he is unloading. Good. And I don't mean it like in an angry way, but he mm -hmm. is, this was, as you know, like he hasn't spoken very much. And so when people accuse him of like, oh, he just wanted the attention and this, like, really? I mean, if he wanted this attention, this is a bad way of showing it because he rarely does interviews. Mm -hmm. And he's just kind of tried to let his work speak for himself. But yes, in this documentary, you get a lot of Colin telling his own story. And so I think a lot of the people who were detractors, they will be embarrassed after they watch some of this. The sad thing about Colin is, is I feel like sometimes when he speaks, people will be like, he's mad. But he's just giving his side of the when story. When he spoke. When yeah. he, when he, when he, when, whenever mad. he says anything, they'd be like, he's mad, he's upset, he's this, he's I've that. I've never seen Colin mad. Ever. Yeah. I just, I just feel like. And this, he's not mad in this. He's let just that telling the story. Be able to tell a story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Is it fair? Is it, is it a fair documentary? Yeah. I mean, I, I think so. I mean, I, I think everybody has been able to create their own narrative about Colin. It's only fair that he finally gets a chance to share what is his perspective share his opinions like everybody else has had the mic it's time that he will mm -hmm. and um you know i i think we definitely did a fair job you know I, as you know how much um fairness and and journalism means to me i was mm -hmm. certainly that was a big part of my responsibility is making sure that this was fair this is not just um something where we're trying to make colin look good or anything like that like colin's story is his story and we're telling that truthfully and accurately and from his perspective when did that drop it will be in 2024. Okay. That's the that's a, that's as broad that's as as succinct as a timeline as, as I can give you. But I'm really impressed with where things are. I love, you know, just the energy and just the passion. You know, Spike, uh, he's been incredible to work with. Just Dope. smart, knowledgeable, all those things. Like legendary filmmaker, you all know. Um, but I've learned a lot doing this. Spike was there when uh, well, never mind. Behind the scenes. Very, yeah, very behind the good, scenes. Behind the scenes movement. But I do miss your sports takes, Jamel. Do you? I talk about this all the time. And you know what? Let me tell you this, Charlemagne. I think you deserve, you should give me credit because I. it took a lot for me to resist texting you the day my 49ers just put, <laughs> why just, not? just beat the brakes off well, y'all. Because <laughs> when it's cause me, I knew this was coming and I would see him in person and I'd rather Jamel, say it to him in person. If I had your number, I would have called you that day. I would have put you <laughs> yeah, on that screen just for five minutes to be like, do you have something to say? When the Dog. 49ers washed them Cowboys. Why do you see a white quarterback do that to a black quarterback? <laughs> yeah. Why are you so happy to see that, Jamel? Huh? <laughs> it ain't Black History Month. What are we talking about? Like, what? Hey, dog. I was just like. Nah, that was bad. Yeah, no, we we a problem. But we a problem for most of them. No, y'all, we knew that, though. We knew that. Yeah, but right? that but we a problem for Dallas specifically. You know, and so when I when that, when that I saw the final score, because I missed most of the game, because I, I had, to, I had some other it. things to do. But I knew we were going to win. I just didn't think it was going to be like that. No, that was bad. <laughs> that was bad. No, I was like, was you know what, I'm going to. I'm gonna give Charlemagne some some privacy, you know, some thoughts and prayers, and then when I see him in person, I'll be like, <laughs> your boys. No, that was demoralizing. The yeah. first two Good. weeks, I'm like, yo, we going to the Super Bowl. Even though I say that every year. Yeah. You know, even with the loss of the Cardinals, oh, that's nothing. Right. We're going to the Super Bowl. But now back you know. against New England. We're going to the Super Bowl. What this was week, the, I'm like, uh, his, his, his daddy texted him and said, Charlemagne, we really going to the Super Bowl. <laughs> Buy your tickets. <laughs> Y'all, yeah. it's just the belief is so hard. <laughs> yeah, this just, is, no, it's been a different conversation. In the group yeah, now, <laughs> no, okay. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the thing that was interesting is that everybody was like, okay, this is the game that show how far away the Cowboys are from the 49ers. Damn. But, like, it's not just about the 49ers. It's where does da Dallas rank in the pantheon of teams that are – supposed to be close to a Super Bowl and they're a lot further behind. Jesus. Like are they like can you say definitively the Cowboys are as good as the Lions? I don't think so. Damn. I don't think you can. So it's not just about where they are with San Francisco. It's like where do they fit as being a team period. Yeah, and that wants like to the win the Super Bowl. Eagles, yes, Lions. Like they're not better Cowboys. than any of those. She's Lions like, not better than any she's of those. Poo Pooing all over your team. <laughs> she's not lying. I'm not she's yeah, the truth. it's no dis disrespect. I mean and just much like most situations like 
that gets a lot of the blame and probably when it goes right, maybe too much credit. Um, but at some point, you know, they're going to have to make a decision about him. It's like, is this the guy? Because it, it does, some of it does feel like Tony Romo all, all over again where they wasted Damn. Tony Romo's ta- talent. Yeah. Wasted it on just historically bad defenses. Like Romo way better than Dak was, though. Yeah, I think Romo is a, is a yeah. better quarterback. But I think you can win with Dak. Like, I think you can win a Super Bowl with Dak. Mm-hmm. Like, you could go to a Super Bowl with Dak. I mean, no disrespect. Yo, but, you know, so disrespect wild. is coming. But, like, the 49ers, they went to the Super Bowl with Jimmy Garoppolo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And were really a bad quarter away from winning it. So, like, I think Dak is better than Jimmy Garoppolo. The problem is with Romo, right? They, they you know, when, when Romo got injured and Dak came in, they were all loving Dak. Mm-hmm. And now Romo's better than Dak. Romo, Romo was better than Dak then. Yeah, yeah Romo like, got injured and Dak new... came. They loved Dak. He but loved that's not Dak. A new take he came out in with. No. Yeah, I think Romo was He came in with Dak's jock strap on. He was Romo so was old Dak. and hurt. And we knew it was over for Romo. Like, Dak, Dak's not nowhere near as good a quarterback as Tony Romo. So, what do you think, Shy? You think they should get rid of Dak? Uh, I think they should get rid of the coaching staff first. I mm-hmm. think they need to bring in a new coaching staff. Okay. Before they try, before they think about getting rid of that. A new coaching staff. Yeah, that... Mike McCarthy's offense is so predictable. It's just like he's prehistoric to me. Right. But I, I, I want it, and it'll never happen. I want Eric Bellamy to be the coach of the. Eric Bellamy. Okay. Eric Bellamy. I'm sorry. Yeah. Eric Bellamy to be the coach. Oh, Bill Bellamy's coach now. Shut up. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I, I, the fact that he went from the Chiefs to the Redskins right. just to be another offensive coordinator is mind boggling to me. He but I sort of get it because. He wanted. He needed to be from up under the Andy Reid shadow because even though Andy Reid would say like, "No, Eric Bieniemy does call the plays, and this is his offense," mm-hmm. people still gave Andy Reid all the credit. You come to the Commanders, uh, it's less of that, you know, frankly, and so mm-hmm. people are able to see in real time, like, "Oh, okay, this is this is what his offense looks like without him having Patrick Mahomes." Gotcha, and gotcha. yeah, so I, I think he just he did it because he had to get from up under a shadow. The other problem too is that you fire Mike McCarthy. And then the same person, same brain trust, is in charge of finding your new coach. Lord have mercy. I mean, a, a coaching, a, a coach opening can be good and bad. In Dallas's case, I think it's bad. So you think Jerry should pass away? Is what you're saying? It doesn't matter because it's going through the family. Damn, it's still the family. Yes, because you got Stephen, you got his daughter. Like it's Damn. still gonna be a Jones run so Jones operation. Jones sell the team, and we won't. <laughs> basically, you're saying we won't be good until Jones. I mean, I, I don't know if it's if it's all strictly on ownership because the one thing I will say about Jerry Jones is like he will he will spend the money to win. Mm-hmm. So it's not that. It's just he won't let his own ego relinquish control. Relinquish control. Yeah, yeah. and he certainly won't hire another coach that could possibly be credited more than him. So, like, everybody's like, oh, Sean Payton, he'll never get a Sean Payton. Like, I don't see it. Like, he'll never get the type of coach, much like he had with Jimmy Johnson, who will ultimately get the credit for getting the team to the Super Bowl. He wants all the credit. So he needs a, a coach that is a little a little bit lesser than, yeah. like in terms of personality, profile. He, he can't take anybody that can compete with his profile. That's why – Deion Sanders would never do it. Like some of the Cowboy fans, like we should hire Deion. I was like, that would never happen. Yeah. <laughs> you, you think Jerry Jones will let somebody come in there and take all the credit and all the shine? No, it's not happening. All right, this is depressing. Let's go back to one uh, one uh, other topic. Okay, Theo Vaughn and Sexy Red. All we right, talking, we talked brought it up a couple of times. <sighs> what about that interview? Is so upsetting, and the reason I say that is because I'm like, Sexy Red, salute to her. Yeah. Political take, right? I know a lot of people. I do know a lot of people in the hood who think that way, and I actually understand why they think that way. But I think that when you, I see, don't understand why they think that way. <laughs> I, just, well, I, well, I get it because it's simple things, right? Oh, right. First step back, let people out of jail. Right. They give Trump credit. No follow up on what happened with that. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the stimulus checks. Right. People got fourteen hundred dollars checks in the mail with Donald Trump's name on right. it. I get it. When you have a government that you feel like has never done anything for you, and you see them do a little something, it looks like. A lot. A, a lot. A lot. Okay. You know what I mean? Gotcha. So it's like, and then when I see all of these people who I know are politically astute beating up on her, I'm like, just educate her. Mm-hmm. Like, just educate the people that think that way. Like, mm-hmm. there's no need to beat up on her. It's sexy red. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that anybody was rushing to hear, you know, what her political exactly. takes were. Mm-hmm. But the problem is that it does, it does uh, uh, unintentional, untold damage still. And... You know, like you said, that's not her fault. She's like, she's a, she's, it, it is and it isn't because, like, you have a platform now, and I know that she's going to learn this in real time and is, and is learning this, unfortunately, some very tough lessons in the last couple of weeks about the things that she's gone viral for is that you're, there's going to be an inherent responsibility. People listen to you. So when they hear you saying things like that and you're saying them whimsically and not very seriously, 
it can do a lot of damage. Like everybody doesn't have to be a Colin Kaepernick or have to be a Malcolm X or Martin Luther King. It's a reason why there was only one of these, <laughs> like one of these a generation, like right. reason why they don't come along a, a lot, but you can't undermine it. Right. It's like, you know, so what I had a problem with is like the misinformation is it wasn't that she gave her political take. She's allowed to give her political take. But she could have said I supported Trump and listed off the reasons uh, that actually made a little bit more sense. Um, yeah, she could have said that because it's her right to have that have that opinion. But it's the misinformation that that is what I see is to be more dangerous when you have that kind of platform, because like it or not, people are going to listen to her. And even though, you know, she talking about they love Trump in the hood. I was like, well, the polls don't really show that. But that's OK. Go ahead. Go off. And so I took the opportunity to your point. Mm-hmm. I saw it as a teachable moment, because, as you said, there are some people who do say the same things. So let's let's uh, let's deal with what's being said, even though Donald Trump's name were on that stimulus check. He did not. The money did not come from him. It didn't, it didn't come right out of his bank account. It was it was passed by Congress people. And that's a part of the general right. collective ignorance that we have. A lot of us don't know how government works. Mm-hmm. There's no shame in that. Because it is a complicated system, but we have to understand how legislation is passed, how policies are made, knowing the right person to be mad at. Because a lot of the things that people are mad at, you know, inflation, other things, I was like, the president doesn't have a whole lot to do with that. And we're in a a huge age of corporate greed like we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And I wish that we had a better handle on who to blame, because then that would help us better strategize. I agree with you 100%. But you know what I tell tell the hood? I just be like... Biden gave out stimmies too. <laughs> like, was his like, name on it though? He didn't put his name he on put, it. But that was brilliant though. I was like, That's it. I mean, no president in history has ever done that. He was like, no, 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 no. The checks got held up because he was like, no, no, I'm going to need that put Donald J. On Trump it. on it. Because he knew, he knew the lasting impact that Correct. would have. But He's right. Technically, you're right. Biden, uh, Trump signed signed it in t- twice. Yeah. Biden signed it in once. Right. So Biden gave out stimmies too. He did. You, that's the hook. Yeah. Right. That's how you get the sexy reds and all that. It, it is. And, and unfortunately, the other part of it is that the amount of media machinery behind the right wing, there's no Democratic oh. equivalent. Mm-hmm. Right. There's no Democratic equivalent to, to Fox News. So when people are like, oh, Democrats have a messaging problem, like, they don't actually have a messaging problem. They're just up against a force that they cannot duplicate. Mm-hmm. Like they can't duplicate having a own a Newsmax channels who 24 seven. This is all they do right. is tell them the same 10 lies over and over again. And they just don't have that because as, as liberal as you may think MSNBC is or CN, CNN, they're still going to mostly call it down the middle. Down the middle is not the same as Democratic messaging that is constantly being like, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. So they're up against something that. That frankly, I'm not sure that they can overcome. But it and it doesn't help when you have really popular people with a platform who continue to parrot the same misinformation as some of these other channels. So I hope mm-hmm. somebody in her camp or somebody, period, pulled her aside and said, "Hey, here are the issues. If you're going to speak about these, and if you're going to take a pro-Trump position, at least if you're going to take one, take one that is a little more informative than the one that know you know your had. facts. That's right. Yeah, know your facts. And people just like to be entertained nowadays too." They do. And Trump uh, is very entertaining. That's why mm-hmm. you see these dudes. By the way, I would bet that most of these people who have Donald Trump chains and stuff, they're not registered to vote. So that's the other thing. Why are we? Why are you even care? Like, like seriously, like why do you even care? Like, I don't know. The people at the rallies, man. I, I, I think those people that well, they, 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 I'm sure they're they registered. registered. They, 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 are, but they you, ready. But I think you talk about like Kodak Black. Yeah, I think you talk about yeah, Sexy Kodak Red. And all that, but, I, but I know they. I'm like, I bet you they're not registered to vote. Yeah. I bet you Sexy Red not registered to vote. I mean, that would have been a, like a great follow up to be like, oh, so are you registered to vote? Are you registered to vote? Are, do you plan to vote for him in the, in the next election? Right. That would have been. Something to uh, follow up to question. bring up with her, but I guarantee you that might be the last political question she answers I'm sure, right? for quite some time. That's oh, right. uh, so in Spotify, mm-hmm. you parted ways with Spotify. I did, uh, I did, and um, you know, listen, uh, I was there. I got there in 2019, and um, you know, Spotify was undergoing quite a change in the sense that, like, they really wanted to be the most prominent brand in the podcast game, mm-hmm. and so a lot of the things, a lot of the ups and downs, and figuring stuff out. Um, sometimes when you become a part of something that's, well, I wouldn't call them necessarily new, but a part of something that's like in a deep evolution period, you can, um, you know, you can wind up, you can wind up experiencing some of their, their growing pains that, which are not necessarily m- out of malice, but nevertheless, they impact your business. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, I think Spotify was overall a great partner. We had a good relationship, but for the things that I wanted to do, they just weren't a fit. And, 
um, you know, it was it was not a an easy parting um, because again, we were able to to produce a lot of good things together. The podcast itself, Jamel Hills Unbothered, you know, won multiple NAACP Image Awards, won Webby Awards. Like it was a very highly regarded podcast. But that and the podcast network that I created for Black women, I just think ultimately weren't a fit for them. Mm. Um, and so. Uh, one thing the experience at ESPN taught me is that when I see certain things and see certain, I guess for lack of a better way to put it, red flags, then I know like I probably am better off before this gets to a point where it is contentious, where we don't like each other as much. It's probably best that I move on. True. Yeah. So because uh, I, I just, I guess I'm really extraordinarily sensitive to those things following the ESPN experience. And so when I saw some of the same decisions being made and same dynamics. I was like, yeah, this is probably a good time. You know, it's like uh, Pittsburgh, the Steelers, they used to be known for this. Is In fact, they were good at, at cutting players too early rather than too late. Wow. Right, gotcha. and so I felt like we should probably cut the relationship now as opposed to later on when this would be bad for both of us. One, one more question. You still think Nikki Haley's racist? <laughs> Did I say that wrong? Just, wait, there was a reason for it. Yeah, yeah, I know why you said that. You said, you said, you, said <laughs> yeah. you thought she was racist for not wanting comma vice president Harris. No, to be so it, it's not that it, because again, like in politics, you're not going to agree with who needs to be the leader. It's not the general disagreement. And I think people took it that way. What I, but I know what she's doing, and I know in general what the conservatives do when it comes to Kamala Harris is. You know, I know vice presidents are have other vice presidents have been scrutinized. You know, mm -hmm. certainly Dick Cheney was. Uh, Biden, I don't think so much. I mean, to be yeah. honest, like nobody really did. Mike Pence, okay. You know, so all of a sudden this infatuation with what the vice president does, it's just funny that certain types of criticisms that have been made about Kamala Harris mm -hmm. are criticisms that are very unique to her being a black woman in that position. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like one of the bullhorns, one of the dog whistles they use is by throwing out, oh, you know she could be president. It's because what they're really trying to say is like, you know this black woman could be president if you reelect Joe Biden. And that's why all of a, not all of a sudden, but that's why his age, even though Trump is like, what? Trump is like about four the same age? Younger, like four years younger. Yeah. They both old, okay? Yeah. They're both old. But the, the focus and the attention and the level of scrutiny on Joe Biden's age and health are in part due because of who is the vice president. Because the, the message they're really trying to send is like, oh, by showing him, you know, because he, as he's told people before, like he, he struggles with stuttering, right? So he's not the most, I don't think, effective public speaker because mm -hmm. of that struggle. He's probably very conscious of it. And, but they are constantly running these clips of him sort of looking out of it because what they're really trying to communicate is like, oh, but you know who's behind him. Do y'all really want a black woman to be president? Mm -hmm. And I feel like Nikki Haley uses that. So one of the reasons, like when Don Lemon said that about when he criticized her and all he was saying was she needs to be careful lobbing the whole ageism thing because there are people out there who feel like women are aged out or they're, they, they're past their prime at a certain point. Like if you say that about a woman, people are going to have problems. So why are you saying this about your political opponents? Because if somebody comes at you that way, you're going to be mad. Mm -hmm. That's all he was saying, right? And she constantly is talking about Biden's age and she's talked about Trump's age before, I believe. And so my whole thing with her is like by constantly drumming up a level of criticism for Kamala Harris, we we know what you're doing. We know the dog right. whistle that you're trying to blow. And given her history, I mean, what her father taught at the HBCU, mm -hmm. um, you know, the fact is she's a person of color in this country. Mm -hmm. And to see some of her opinions about affirmative action and about just in general, the conditions um, of people of color and black people specifically in this country. I mean, it, it took a horrible shooting in Charleston for her to understand why the co Confederate flag, flag is not appropriate. Yeah. Right. So there's a lot of things on her record to check her about. So I'm not calling her a flat out racist, mm -hmm. but what I will say is that she's very comfortable using racist dog whistles to further and advance her political position. I so, feel like the uh, biggest opposition Vice President Harris is going to face is going to come from in her own party. Yes, I, I agree. That, I think that there's people in her party right now who don't want her to be vice president. Because did you see I the agree. article that came out I yesterday did. in the, I did. the New York Times? And and it's it's the hit pieces that are done yeah, on her. Like, it's, it's just I don't. I mean, I get it, but I don't get it. Like I had to go Google and see well, what did she do? Like I was like, it just came out of nowhere. This yeah. long ass hit. I mean, piece. and even even some of us who are just like, well, what is she doing? Where is she being? Like she literally speaks every day, guys. Like I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know what to tell y'all. Mm -hmm. Like you're like, where is she? I'm like, uh, I because I'm on the mailing list. I get her schedule practically every. 
every day. Like she's always doing a lot of things. Um, like I know right now she's on a college tour to, to you know, not only just promote what they're doing in terms of alleviating um, some of these student loans, but also to just encourage people again to to, ac- to pursue um, their academic pursuits because somehow in this country we got to a point where now degrees are bad. Now yeah, going to college yeah, yeah. is bad. But no, that like she's been subjected to a lot of hit pieces and you could tell they're hit pieces because of some of the things they say about her. And you can tell they're from within. And you could tell they're from within. Yep. It's like, because um, I think in that, is this, this is the article that mentioned how much time she spends on her hair. On her hair. Like, that's crazy. are you serious? <laughs> like, that's what we doing? Yep, yep, <laughs> like, yep. on her hair, like, she's a black woman. I bet she is going to spend some time on her hair yeah, because man. the moment she doesn't look presentable, guess what the conversation is going to be about the vice president? Mm, so it's like she's damned if she do, does, damned, damned if she, she doesn't. Mm-hmm. Like she's caught in a really tight position. And I feel like it is really, it's really neutering what I think makes her such a strong politician. And like it or not, Joe Biden would not have gotten elected without her. Mm-hmm. He would not have. She well, I, was the strongest, I think, person for him to run with. It and I was think her. The general election polls that you see that show Trump beating Biden are scaring people in the Democratic Party and they're looking for somebody to blame. Correct. And it's her. And I think that there is some type of groundswell happening in that party to get her out of the picture and put somebody else there. I don't think they're going to do that because I think they know that that would be politically way worse. Okay. Because so, even yeah. with the conversations that have been had about Vice President Harris in our community and there being some mixed feelings in our community about her. Um, even th- with all that being said, if they take her off the ticket, th- that will not play well with us because black we black people overwhelmingly support her, mm-hmm. right? And this is we're the people you need to bring to the voting party. Mm-hmm. You cannot win. Overwhelmingly support black. People? Overwhelmingly support her. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, look, I know people. I know people are gonna watch this, and I know they'll comment, you know, and say like, no, overwhelmingly support Kamala Harris. Mm. Look at who's voting in our. It, they like in our community. Look who vote. Older mm-hmm. people vote, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You think older people, older black people, don't love Kamala Harris? They love Kamala Harris. I think so. Absolutely, a thousand no. percent. Dude, have you, he's like, I, black people gonna vote black people. Black people, they Especially gonna vote for black her. People. Like they will. They I mean, love. I mean, we're Kamala. always gonna show black people. Yeah, gonna always we'll show, show vote Democrat, but I, black I, people, I, I they, hear a lot of older black people, men and women. They don't really. They gonna vote for Kamala. They, they man, I, I don't know. Yeah, they gonna I, vote I, for Look, I, I, I think. The majority of black people support Kamala Harris. Mm. I do. Mm-hmm. Again, I'm not saying that there have not been criticisms in our community that people have brought to the surface. Like, we sure about this or not? Majority support Kamala Harris. Okay. All right. I mean, is it, look. Listen. Do you feel like that there's another viable VP that nope. will get? No, I don't think that. Exactly. I don't, th- I don't think the Democrats have mm-hmm. no bench. Period. No, it's, it's thin. Yeah. <laughs> it's thin. Like when you look at who could have run bench, with it. Just be clear. He said bench. Bench. No bench, clearly. <laughs> well, Y'all didn't it sounded like you said bitch. No. no. She <laughs> heard bitch and I heard bitch. No, I, for real. That's no, why I said I bitch. bitch. That's Come on, Bianca. You from South Carolina now. I, you understand me. Well, you heard. Yeah, I so you said, said bitch. Yeah, no other bitch. Said I said bitch. I said, let me clear. Bench. He said bench, ladies and gentlemen. I was bench. like, I, th- a lot of times when people think that you said something on air that you haven't said, I was like, look at the person next to him. If the person next to him doesn't respond, <laughs> but, then that but, means you know that they probably didn't say but, it. You know, I heard it, but I was like, you didn't respond. But I looked over your shoulder and she was like, so right. I was like, I'm not the if only one. If you would have actually said that, you I think said, I would have been like, hey, man. <laughs> like, I, I said, let me clear it up now. I was just like, no, he said bitch very clearly. Bitch. Bitch. You're from South Carolina. Bitch. Now, she made me question. I was like, Daddy, mouth no, like you said, did. <laughs> you said, you said, bitch. I, th- I know I did, bench. but it sounded like you said just now. <laughs> Say bench. Bench. I said they don't have no bench. Right. The yeah. hard end. Oh, hard the hard end. They ain't got no bench. Bench. They got no benches. They ain't got no benches. All right. I mean, the sentence wouldn't even make sense. No. Like the Democrats ain't got no bitch. Like that ain't yeah, wouldn't even make no sense. sense. <laughs> You just talked about Kamala Harris. Oh, then he Lord. said, no. they ain't got no other no, bitch. No, no, But he's his bitch. No, he like got no, no other, other bitch. B- no. Oh, my God. I'm I know the only one heard it. No. I'm glad you're here. If you wasn't there, they'd be like, oh, this guy's crazy. Oh, that'd be crazy. They'd be like, Charlemagne on Kamala Harris. They ain't somebody got no still other might, bitch. Way, somebody still might what? say that. We absolutely. live in that era. What? Somebody like, still might say that. You absolutely did not say that. Jesus Christ. People, he didn't say it. No, he didn't. Bitch. Bench. Oh my God! Bench. Oh my goodness! All right, <laughs> Look at that. ladies and gentlemen, uphill a memoir. The paperback is Thank out right you now. Guys. We appreciate you for joining us, <laughs> and it's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club.